Welcome to Botany 360 on our first workshop of the series. This one is on writing a good title. We're going to apply Einstein's dictum here that if you can't explain your work simply, you don't understand it well enough. Something that I have really found to be true in my own work, simple explanations work much better than complex ones. And I wish I had known as a very young scientist how to write a simple title, how to write a simple clear abstract. So we're going to work with this idea. I'm Dr. Bruce Kirchhoff. I'm a faculty member, a professor of biology at UNC Greensboro. And the technical support is provided by my colleague at the University of Vela Cruz. Thank you, Bruce. I'm Eliezer Cocoletti. Hi, everybody. I'm from Mexico. Uh, currently, I'm a professor at the University of Veracruz. Uh, briefly, I tell you that I met Bruce at the Botany Congress in 2018. So I take the workshop for presentation skills. And I hope that this, will, this workshop helps you to make appropriate guides for your presentation. Thank you. Well, we're going to get start right in. This is a interactive workshop, so we're going to ask you to be doing things during the workshop. And the first thing we want to do is talk just a tiny bit about what makes a good title, and then have you look at these titles and tell us what you think is the best title that's here. So what a good title is, according to me, and according, and I hope you will agree with me by the end of this workshop, a good title tells you the main point of the research. So you should read the title and you should know what it's about, not just what the research is about, but what the main conclusion of that research is. So that if you're choosing to go to a talk, you can look at the titles quickly. You can see, ah, this title looks interesting, or this talk looks interesting, this talk looks interesting, this talk looks interesting, even if those talks are outside your specialty. Now, of course, no matter what the title is, if the talk is in your specialty, you're going to go to hear that talk. And so I want you to set that aside for a minute. If any of these happen to be in your specialty, I want you to set that aside and pretend that they're not. And I want you to look at these titles and fill out a form here to tell us which one you think is the best title in terms of what would get you to go to that talk. Where would you know what the talk was really about? So you'll see something like this. Well, we can take a look and see what people think. Oh, it's spread a little bit more evenly than I thought. So I think we've got... Ones that are out, wrangling heter heterogeneous plant trait data. No one voted for that at all. Does someone want to say something about why they did not pick that one? It's it's just very vague. Like I'm I'm really not sure what it's trying to tell me. Yeah, so it's a it's a cute title, and I know scientists love to write cute titles, but it <clears throat> these kind of cute titles really speak to in groups. They speak to the little people in your lab and things who know what you're doing and stuff, and they can look at this title and say, well, that's really cool. That's really like Anthony's research. I just think he's really smart in doing this. But if they don't know you and they don't know what your research is, they're kind of left in the dark. Someone else who picked a title, who picked one, want to tell me, want to tell us why you picked that one and why? Well, I, I picked the fifth one because I, I think it, it specifies the organism, it's sunflower, I, the domestication process, which people might be interested in, um, and it also tells us what, what the data is from, is the archaeological DNA. So yeah, you're right. I mean, it tells us a lot about the title. It tells us it's going to be about this model organism or semi-model organism, the sunflowers, and about domestication, which is a really interesting issue if you're interested in it. But let's suppose you don't have any interest. You don't know anything about domestication. What's this person going to tell you about domestication? What's their conclusion about domestication? Can you tell from the title? We have a comment in the chat. Yeah. Not from the title. Yeah, so that's what I would think. I would think that you can't tell from the title. You'd have to go to the talk to find out what was, what was really what this person was going to say about sunflower domestication. <clears throat> so again, if you set aside the fact that you're interested in sunflower domestication or domestication in general, and you had to choose between these titles, this is not the one I would choose. I mean, I think it's a it's not a bad title, but it, it's an intermediate one. Someone else wanna speak up for one of the titles? Good afternoon. So I would like to talk about the third one. So I feel like up until where it uses Salping syndrome, I feel like it's very specific because it mentions how it's differentiating the expressed genes 
and it talks about the evolution in reduced in the reduced nectar, you know. So especially the reduced nectar because it could have just said nectar or you know another part of the plant, but it's specified in that. But the reason I don't really like the end part selfing syndrome is because a lot of people who aren't really interested in that area wouldn't know what it is. Like for example, I just had to look that up and find out what it was. So I feel like it's specific, but that part in particular isn't. Yeah, it's a pretty good title. And I I agree with you, selfing syndrome is a little bit jargony, right? If you don't know what selfing syndrome is, you have to look it up and find out. And if you're flipping through things in a meeting, you're looking at a book or you're looking at a website trying to decide to go, maybe you don't have time to look up selfing syndrome. So you might just skip that one. It also doesn't tell you exactly what these differentially expressed genes do. It says they contribute to the evolution of nectar, reduced nectar, but how do they how do they do that? How do they contribute? In what way are they contributing to reduced nectar production? Anyone else want to speak about number three or any of the others? How about number one? Honestly, that one reads more like a review paper and less like a, a talk. Like it just seems again, it's very vague. It doesn't it doesn't actually tell you what the talk is going to be about. Right, it's like a review paper. Now, there are conditions, cases under which you might go to this one, this talk, above all the other talks. What condition might that be? Well, if it's your field, then um, it might be something that you're interested in, just to kind of know. Okay, what what it might be your field? A second one, second reason. Maybe, maybe if you are completely new to the area, and you want to get a a sense of how uh, all of these is structured. Yeah, that's. I didn't think of that one. That's a great idea. That's a great reason why you might go to a talk like this. Um, the new to the area. Thing. Now, what kind of person would give a talk like that? They would give that overview. Beginning investigator, postdoc, middle career scientist, senior scientist. Probably a senior scientist or at least someone who's very experienced. Yeah, probably a senior scientist. And so maybe there's a name associated with it. And you don't give a darn what his talk title is or what her talk title is, you're going to go see this person because you've been hearing about them and this is the first time you got to go to hear their talk. So sometimes it really doesn't matter what your title is, but as young scientists, it probably does matter. They're not going to, people aren't going to know you. They're not going to come to your talk because they know your name and you've had a hundred papers out there and they want to see what you're like and they want to see how you're present. They're not going to do that. They're going to come to your talk because they want to hear what you have to say. So they don't. So they're not. They're not guessing. So if they have to choose between two two talks, two titles, one they have to guess what they're going to do, and one they're going to say, oh, I know what this one's going to be. They are like more likely to go to the one where they know what it's going to be if there's any interest at all there, and your title can create that interest. Let's look at number four. So four was the one that I think is the best there. I don't think it's a perfect title, but it's the, out of these, I think it's the best because it tells you that about four traits. It tells you, and then it tells you the main results. They differentiate pollination syndromes and they differentiate species, but they don't predict the identity of the floral visitors. And then it says two castellasia. So we're going to have to talk about this little last two words here. So let's just imagine we had this title and we removed the last two words. This would look like a very interesting and general title. It tells you what it's going to be about. It um, And it tells you the two different big results that you're going to get from listening to this talk. Now, they added these last two words. They added the species that they're looking at or the genus that they're looking at. Does that make the talk less interesting? I'd like your opinion on that. I do think it, it makes it less interesting because <clears throat> it makes it less, less, less generalizable. I, I don't know if that word exists. It makes it very specific. Uh, which it may be, but then again, uh, it's like it's it's less attractive. The title is longer, and and maybe I I see I see it would be more much more interesting without the 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 species uh, the plant species. Okay, I agree with you, but there may be a problem. What's the What's the problem with removing those last two words? Well, what might be the problem with removing those last two words? And Daniel is not the only one who needs to answer this. Anyone, if they'd like to do it. But I'm happy to hear from Daniel again. 
I mean, people could argue that you're being a little misleading because you're talking about it as if it's generalizable, but then they go to the talk and they're like, oh, it's just about this one genus. Like, that's not what I was expecting. Okay, who decides first? Who's the first person that decides whether it's generalizable? So I guess the person analyzing the data itself? Yeah. And that's actually, if you're putting yourself in that position, you say you, you are the person, the scientist is, who's analyzing the data. Um, and so here, I just wanted to read from the chat. Um, Blanca says, it will, sound, it will sound like a generalization to use, put, if you take it out, if you take out two castellet, I think she means. So you, as the researcher, have to think about your data, and you have to think about, is this research that I'm going to, data and results I'm going to present, is this an example of a, um, of a more general pattern that just happens to be about this genus or about this species, because you have to test it on something, or is it really something that's unique to this genus? It's going to be easier to attract an audience if it's a general pattern. So that's something you should think about when you're actually thinking about your research and thinking about your title. Writing a good, concise title is about a lot more than writing a good, concise title. It really comes back to what Einstein said in that first slide. If you can't write a good, concise title, you don't understand your research well enough. Okay, we'll look at our second group of titles. Okay, we've got 17 responses. Okay, well, we've got a clear winner here at this point, and that is low atmospheric CO2 levels, induced mutual carbon accumulation. That's the highest one. The second one is combined stressors of drought and invasion reduce Douglas fir performance. Talk about them. Anyone want to talk about the one that they chose? I, for example, know it's against the rules we just were told about being. Um, like describing the results, but I like uh, the ones like number three that are intriguing because it doesn't tell me the results and I want to go to that talk and see what were the results. Uh, sometimes too specific or giving me the results uh, beforehand makes me like I don't have to go to the talk because everything was just said. Do you work on flowering? Yes, absolutely. I think I've made my point. People who are working in the area are going to go to the talk, no matter what the title is. It's not those people who you want to need to attract. It's the other other people who don't know if they want to hear what you're having to say. Your your task is, I believe, not just to attract the little tiny in group, but to make your results so interesting that people who wouldn't normally come to hear you are going to come to hear your talk. And why do you want to do that? As a young scientist. You want to, your name to be out there so that people remember you because when they have a job, they're going to think about this great talk that they came from. And I'll tell you, it's not going to be from a department full of people who are working on flowering or on community structure because if they've got those people already, if they're a department full of those and they're not going to hire, probably not going to hire another one. It's going to be a department of people who aren't interested in those things, but say, well, maybe we should have someone who works on flowering. And so they, and they go to your talk and they say, well, that was fantastic. Let's make sure she knows about this job we're going to have open. We'd like to see an application from her. Most people are not going to read everything about your talk. They're not going to read the abstract. They're going to go down the list and they're going to look at the titles. And they're going to decide based on the titles what they're going to, what they're going to go to. Anyone else want to talk about one of the other ones? How about number two? People like number two? There's Alexis. I would argue that the more descriptive the title, like number five, seems more intriguing to me because I want to know more about the study, how, why. And that is, that's been my reaction to very specific titles also, exactly that same reaction. Tell the audience what your conclusion is in your title. The title should be the summary of your research. It's what most people, most abstracts that I see at conferences, put as the last couple sentences in the abstract. Make that your title. So we'll look at a couple of individual titles now, and I hope you'll interact with me on these. How would you improve this title? You think about it, what's wrong with this title, or how would you improve it? What would you like to say about it? I feel like the first part of the title, um, before the semicolon, or, or the colon, my bad, um, the value of small collections, I feel like that's not, the rest of the title doesn't really explain why the small collections are valuable. Like, I, I almost feel like if you cut that out and just started at 12 on account of type specimens, 
just leaving that would be more interesting. So yeah, the, it's very vague what that is, the first thing's about. If you were to ask this author what they thought was the main important thing of the title, would it be the value of small collections or trial on a tight on unaccounted type specimens, what's the main thing they would want you to take away from this? Probably the larger concept, um, and that the latter part is just like their specific example. Yeah, that's what I would think it would be. And of course, we never know. We're not. We can't speak for these people. But if I wrote this title, that's what I'd want them to do. I'd be. I'd. Be, I'd probably work at a small herbarium, and I'd say, God, pay attention to us too. You know, you don't just not just not the big collections that are valuable. Here's an example of how we are valuable. Here we've got a comment from Mariana. The value of small collections, 12 new type specimens rediscovered from an 1893 um, expedition. Yeah, well, there's rediscovered type specimens that are important to have. I, I think that's a really nice rewording of, of this title. What's missing from this title? I think what's missing here is the big question that they're asking. Why is it important that CO2 levels induce nocturnal comet accumulation in the lycophyte genus Isoides? What does that have to do with anything? Why, why is that anything more than a meaningless little data point? So what's missing here for me is the question that's being addressed. Does earlier flowering impact plant community seed set? How would you improve that? What's missing is how, how does flowering, uh, earlier flowering impact your community seed set? Yes. So the answer to the question is missing. There's other reasons for doing this besides just attracting people to your talk. If you wanted to talk to someone who is not in your field, that I mean someone in the general public, a title like this, a title that asks a question, is completely useless. This communicates nothing to the general public. However, if you can phrase your title or phrase your research in a way that tells them concisely what you found and why it's important to a general question, you will find that most people, most intelligent people in the public will be interested in that. They're in general interested in science. They're in general interested in new things in science, but they are not interested in the way that science is presented to them most of the time. So being able to write a nice, concise title has implications far beyond what you do in, in your research. Well, there were a couple of questions here. Here's Taryn. It's very easy for someone not to not experienced in this field to be intimidated by a topic, asking a question they can't answer. Yeah, right. Okay, so we're going to go on. It's going to be your turn now. Not that it hasn't been your turn already, but now it's really your turn. And people should be coming back from the breakout rooms now. They've been working on titles from journal articles where we've given them an abstract and the title and asked them to try to improve it. And we'll see here in a minute how they were doing with that. So here's the list of the titles. If someone would like to come forward and say you were working on this title, we'll take a look at what you've done and talk about it. So we did number three, the phylogenetic escalation. Okay, let me switch that and let me see if I can make it a little bigger. So you want to tell us about the highlighting and how you came up with a new title? Yeah, so the title itself was extremely vague and very short. So, which is, you know, there. Yeah. And um, so we were like, well, okay, we're going to read through the abstract and we're going to highlight what seems to be like the questions that they're asking and the outcomes. Um, and so the thing highlighted in red is the most specific answer to their question, but it's jargony enough that we're like, that's not going to be good for a general audience. So this last sentence at the bottom here, um, we were like, okay, I think this is a, a good takeaway that we can work with and make a title that is uh, vague enough to not be alienating, but specific enough not be too vague. Um, and so that's where we came up with our better title there. It's just kind of a rewording of that last sentence. Yeah, that's good. And oftentimes you'll find that these last sentences, especially in really good journals like Proceedings of the National Academies like this, you'll, especially in those journals, you'll find that the ending of the abstract will be a very nice summary of what they want you to take away from it. And you can use that to write a very nice title as you've done. It's just surprising that the authors don't always do this, but I think it's just a habit now that people haven't gotten into this. You're going to see more and more of these titles as you um, as you look more <clears throat> as you look at the best journals. And in fact, if you look at Nature and Science now, especially in Nature, you're seeing more and more of these, these kinds of titles. So much so that I sometimes think, ah, oh, well, 
I don't really need to do these workshops anymore. People know how to do this already. But it's clear that not everyone does. But they are coming in the best journals. Now you're seeing more of these kind of titles. Yeah, so that's a really nice, that's a really nice, nice work, a nice way to approach it, a nice title. Um, let me see, I can show you that I what I did when I got to that. This is number three. I think mine is going to be pretty similar to yours. This does not mean that my title is better than yours. I just what I did, I just wanted to see another example for someone who thought about it. Someone else want to volunteer? Okay, so um comfort, I don't know if I'm mispronouncing the name. Comfort and I worked on the nine uh, the nine article flower production. And uh, we suggested uh, uh, a title that is a little bit longer than the, the, the one that was. Uh, Bumblebees Accelerate Flower Production by Damaging Leaves. And then, and I am very sorry, I came back to it uh, uh, and, and added a bit at the end under resource scarcity. Um, and I think this, this uh, helps to 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 better address the the specific question. Yeah, and so it's always going to be a question that you're going to have to decide as the investigator whether additions like under resource scarcity are necessary in there. And in this in this case, it it probably is. It might be. I mean, the title that they used in this case, the role of bees in accelerating fall production, is not terrible. That's not a really bad title at all. Um, it doesn't say exactly what the role is, doesn't you know? But it kind of does because it improves. So, well, it's really not a bad title. I also like your title. I think that it's it's very good, and it does make it clear that it, it's only under certain kind of conditions, which might be very important. My title, I think, is pretty similar to yours. Bumblebees damage plant leaves and accelerate flower production when pollen is scarce. Very similar to yours. The only thing that I did there is I made resource scarcity explicit. That it's a scarcity of pollen. So good work, both of these. Great work, right? Great finding um, ways to improve these titles. You have another <clears throat> volunteer to look at their work. Okay, all right. So the first one is um, mine and Solange Akima. Oh, sorry, Akimana. I do hope I'm, I'm pronouncing right. So the we thought that interaction of pollination and herbivory facilitates rapid evolution of self in intrasicacy is a little bit better than original. So that's your suggestion. And I do think that original is kind of bad and rapid plant evolution doesn't tell us anything about what's going on there. But the second part is pretty good, so I decided to keep it. I mean, that's a nice rewriting of the title. How about the other one? So the fourth one is also very nice. Um, makes it specific to this individual species. Talks about how this interaction drives evolution of floral traits. That's that's good. It talks about the results. Third one, pollination and herbivory interaction drives rapid evolution in plants. So if you thought it was a, if you thought your results were generally applicable to this question of rapid evolution, then that's a nice title there. And then you'll focus in on brassicaceae and explain why brassicaceae or brassicarepa is a good model plant for this question. You do have to address that in your talk. Doesn't have to be in the title if you're confident that your work is, at, is addressing that question. The second one, interactions of interaction study of pollination and herbivory in Brassicaceae, unfortunately, doesn't really tell us what the result is. It tells us that the um, person who's speaking is going to talk about the interactions between pollination and herbivory, but what 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 effect do they have? Um, I I can go next. We did uh, number five. Okay, just look at the <clears throat> original title here, Global Climatic Drivers of Leaf Size. And you have daytime and nighttime leaf to air temperature variation determine geographic gradients in leaf size. And if we look at my title, I think it's almost exactly the same as yours. In fact, I think I like yours a little better. Anyone else? Do we have anyone that has attempted this and hasn't gone yet? If we could look at number seven, peptide signaling. Okay, so original title, Peptide signaling for drought-induced tomato flower drop, and I'll let you take it from there. Reading through it a couple of times, I decided to come up with the title, Drought-Induced Tomato Flower Drop is Regulated by the Signaling Peptide Phytosulfocine. Yeah, I think that's nice. I think that's a nice summary of it, and I mean, that's 
uh, much more interesting to me, who knows very little about tomatoes or drought-induced flowering drop or a signaling peptide, that title, I am much more inter interested in reading that paper than I am about peptide signaling for drought-induced tomato flower drop. I have like no interest in that. And this other title gets me um, kind of interested because I know that this peptide is doing something in there, it's regulating it, and these people are going to tell me about how that regulation works. I'm more interested in that. We don't have very much time left, just a few minutes. Come back to gallery view here. If you would like, if you would turn on your cameras, please, for our last little bit of discussion. When you're writing your abstract and we're writing your title, make sure you know what you want the audience to take away and put that in your title. And I think you'll find you'll get a better audience, of a better reaction to your talk, and even more important, you're going to be able to present a better talk because you're going to know what the main point is. You're not going to have to swim around in data and say, well, it said this and it said that and those other things. You're going to be able to construct a nice, coherent story that the audience is going to be able to have, understand and take away a main point from. Because if you're going to get the audience to remember something from you, well, the first thing you want them to remember is you. That's the most important thing you want them to remember. But they're going to usually remember you in a scientific talk because they remember something about your talk. And if you're lucky, you're going to remember one thing. Put that thing in your title, reinforce it in your talk. They'll remember that one thing, and then they'll remember you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. This is super Thank helpful. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.